Perfect. Okay, cool. Thank, uh, thank you for introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're going to talk a little bit about how we shape products, hopefully, that users love by leveraging continuous discovery. Uh, so just to start off a little bit about me, who I am, why I'm here. Uh, my name is Masha or Maria, and I live in Brno here in Czech Republic. I'm with Red Hat for uh, almost nine years now. Um, I worked on Fedora design starting up, and then I worked on some internal products, and then I sort of moved on to uh, work on the more customer-facing side. So I worked on the Red Hat Trusted Application Pipeline, a little bit on OpenShift, on Quay, and a bunch of other things too. So in my work, I like to combine sort of thinking about users, talking to them, uh, finding out what their needs, pain points are, and then working with engineers to implement them, hopefully. Um, all the while keeping in mind uh, checking with the needs and users regularly. And I also am a big fan of graphic design, uh, so I design things as well, like logos, icons, and t-shirts. So that's just a little about me. Uh, most importantly, I'm a part of a bigger team of UXD, which is, uh, crazily enough, 130 plus designers, researchers, engineers, we're all working together. Um, so this is our vision statement, just so we know what we do. A uh, couple things to highlight here. We are creating data-informed and desirable experiences. And data-informed means it's not based on our whims and assumptions and something we just like to do, but rather based on some data, so something we get from our users. And desirable, so hopefully we're building things that people need and desire and would enjoy using. Um, so as a team, on the whole, uh, we research, design, and develop things uh, in collaboration, of course, with engineers, product management, other, a lot of other team members we have. And we collaborate with different teams. Um, people are coming in. Welcome. So I'm, I'm here, I might say, with bridge the technical world, bring the technical world to the human world, because whatever Red Hat is building is not always easiest to understand or to design for, but hopefully we'll bridge that gap altogether. Uh, so here, I would like to maybe take a little feel for the audience. So maybe uh, who here is an engineer or programmer or something like that, so more technical. All right, cool. <laughs> Do we have any designers? I see one. <laughs> oh, two. Perfect. Two designers. Oh, two and a half. Yeah, OK. Uh, <laughs> Do we have any product managers? All right, cool. Uh, four. Very good. A anybody I didn't name, like any role, they want to just shout out. Uh, oh, technical writer, there you go. Hi, welcome. Two technical writers? No. No? Where are you? Coaches. Agile coaches. Very cool, very cool. Welcome. Quality manager. Quality manager. Very cool. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Welcome, everybody. Hope this is uh, useful for you. All right, uh, so what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about what is continuous discovery and why it is important and how it influenced whatever we're building um, in, uh, in my team specifically. Um, so uh, who is familiar with the term continuous discovery? Like I know you hear continuous a lot. Some people from my team know what continuous discovery is very well. OK, so we'll go through discovery and delivery and what it is, what it isn't. We'll talk a little bit about Agile methodology and how it all fits in. And then I'll give you an example of a practical application. And hopefully, in the end, you will understand what continuous discovery is, how to do it, and what you can do yourself, like personally, for your team. All right, so let's start by talking about discovery and delivery a little bit. Uh, so one more question towards the audience. Who's uh, read this book? Heard of it? Maybe Teresa Torres's name. Okay. Uh, so no, no worries if you haven't heard about it. If you haven't read it, uh, that's fine. Um, in the end, if you want to find out more, you don't have to buy the book. You can just Teresa talks a lot about this, and the book came out some years ago. So you can go on YouTube, you can go on Spotify, listen to her talk about it. She'll do it much better than I do. But yeah, just my tip to you. All right. Um, so let's, first of all, let's talk a little bit about delivery, right? A lot of focus lately, well, lately in the last 10, 15 years on delivery and how to do it right. So uh, by now, I think most teams have moved 
away from the waterfall delivery where you get your requirements in the end and everybody builds the thing, like builds the whole product and they release it, right? So now people are hopefully working in the more sort of agile way and doing rapid delivery cycles or release cycles, right? Um, do some analytics in the end to sort of understand, are people using it? Are they not using it? What's going on? So they want to understand usage. Um, and then they go back and build again. And maybe they will start it with an MVP and they will add things on top of it. And so just like realizing that your product is never done, that you have to go back and do it again. And based on analytics, maybe change things, add things, et cetera. But like, OK, but how do you know? So you're doing this right, but how do you know that you're building the right thing? How do you know that you're building something that users want? I'll give you an example. Every month or so, my, my colleague and I, and she's in the audience right there, uh, so we do this thing that's called design clinic, and it's like an office hour thing in the office. Every month, we just encourage people to come and ask us for design advice. So if like, they're building something, an application, anything, they can come and we'll give them advice. Um, and oftentimes, they will come and they will tell us about their product, and then we'll ask, have you talked to any of your users? And you'll be surprised to know that they have not. More often than not, they haven't talked to a single person. So they're just building something. Uh, so here I am to sort of emphasize the need to actually talk to somebody that's not just yourself. Um, so what is this discovery? It's building the right thing. So teams will always, uh, all, not always, sorry, sometimes will build something and then they will ask, well, where are users showing up? Uh, or if you ask them, who are you building this for? They would know. Or do they know some, that's something that users want? So how do, you, how do you decide what to build? Who is it for? Are people using it? Will they be able to? Is that something that they really need? How do you find out? So the discovery thing is this preliminary phase that would involve researching the problem space, sort of framing the problem that you want to solve. And then you gather evidence and in initial direction. So then you decide what to build. But it also is continuous, so you'll want to do that over and over and over again. Um, so here I'm to emphasize the importance of this continuous loop, right? So you do the discovery, you do the delivery, and just kind of keep going. Like I said, digital products are never done. It's not yet like you build a, I don't know, a phone, a mouse, and you release it in the world, and that's it, and you're done. Or like if you're drawing a logo, you draw a logo, you put it out there, you're done. Uh, with digital products, not the thing. So with discovery, you know and you can feel confident that you're building the right thing. Um, just to emphasize this point, you can go on online later and just Google or ask ChatGPT, are there any products that failed because they didn't talk to their users? And I'm sure you'll find some examples. One of them, um, I was talking to some people, they said Blackberry is a good example because they were big at some point in the US. Like everybody was using them, not only in the US, like all over the world, people were using them. And then at some point, they were just not, because they failed to keep up with the market. I don't know if they talked to users or not. I hear there's a whole story. OK, so just to reemphasize, very simply put, discovery is deciding what to build, and delivery is building it. And like I said, lately, there might be a little more emphasis on the delivery bit than on discovery. Um, so hopefully, we can shift that a little bit, so move from that project mindset, where you maybe do some research in the beginning, and then you build it, and then you maybe ask users again to just doing that continuously even. All right. So you might ask, OK, that's very nice and cool, but how do I do that? Like, how do I do that for my team or for my project, right? So let's talk a little bit about the details and how you actually can do that. Um, and this is a definition from Teresa Torres' book again. So I'm going to refer to her a lot because she's a, she's a product coach. She works with teams and helps them build products and any kind of teams from from two people to big corporations, so it doesn't matter what size your team is. Um, so I'm just going to read this, and then we're going to go line by line. So OK, uh, continuous discovery is weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product, where they conduct small research activities in pursuit of a desired outcome. Now, let's go on and unpack this. OK, uh, so first of all, weekly or regular touch points with customers. So some of you might be familiar with user research where you do this whole big studies and they take forever, right? So you have to recruit users, they have to prepare this thing, they have to do that. Um, and then you can maybe do that once per, per month or like once per two months. Um, so this one is more about regular touch points. So if you can 
check with them every day. Like if you work at, um, uh, Teresa gives an example of Walmart. If you work at Walmart, you can talk to your customers every day. Um, more often, that's not the case. Like even uh, for my team, that's not the case. You cannot talk to them every day. Maybe not even every week. Like weekly is, uh, but regular is good. And most importantly, going from none to some will be good enough. Already good. All right. Now, um, that would lead to more rapid prototyping that you can do. So if you, ha if you know you have talked to your customer like maybe once every two weeks or once a month or like maybe every week, who knows, you will, you will design more and more and more and more. And that way you can sort of check with them if you have some product decision you want to make, like maybe a little thing, maybe a bigger thing, but you can check with them regularly. Um, and they also help you to overcome this sort of this thing that's called curse of knowledge. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about it in a second, but it's okay. I'm just going to jump over to the slide and then I'm going to go back. Uh, so this curse of knowledge is when you're working on something, you're working on it, you're working on it, and you know so much that you become an expert, but you can forget that your users are not experts, so they just, they're coming from a different place. So you make, if you make the decision from your point of view, from an expert point of view, it might not work for the users. All right, so let me go back for a second. So let's go on to the second line. By the team building the product, who, who, who that is? Who is the team building the product? There we go here. All right, so typically uh, we talk about a product trio, and that would be a product manager, a designer, and a software engineer. So that would be like a leading group that would lead that discovery. Doesn't mean that it has to be these three people or just these three people. It can be more people. Uh, depending on the decision you have to make, you can invite other folks. Um, it can be a bigger group of people, it doesn't matter. It's important that it's a, various roles are involved because different people, if talking to somebody in an interview, they will give you different perspectives and they will hear different things too. All right. So where they conduct small research activities. Like I said, traditional uh, user research can be a little long, so it will take a long time. So what are these small research activities that you can do? And I will give you an example. So one of them, and here you can take this as a practical tip, one of them is called a speedboat. And it's a very quick way to sort of find out what are the pain points and the needs of your users. And this is a workshop-like activity. So these are literal steps that you will take to do that. Like so, so once you know what is the problem that you want to solve, and that's represented right there, on like a paradise, so that's where you want to get, that, that's, the, that's the outcome you want to achieve in the end. So you know that. So you formulate that. You can also formulate the business sort of strategy that you need. So like what will business gain or like connect it to you to a company strategy. Uh, so you put that on the board. Let's say it's called paradise. So your user outcome, your business outcome. And then you can brainstorm the pain points that are keeping people from actually reaching that paradise. So that, here's where you will work with your customers. So you will ask them what is keeping them, what's the anchors that are sort of prohibiting them from reaching that paradise, you know. Um, so this could be a very quick activity. Everybody will write it down like on a piece of paper or in a sticky note. You can do it offline, online, doesn't matter. Everybody will just work on their own. They will think, what are my pain points? What, what's bothering me? Why can't I reach that? And they will put it on, on this board. Maybe not on this board, but on some sort of board. Then you can group those tickets. Usually there's a couple of themes that emerge. And then you can discuss it. And then you can also review them together. Because sometimes people will write like one word and you'll know what it is. So you have to discuss it with them. And then, and then once you've done that, so you have your pain points, you have maybe grouped them by topic, then you can actually work with them. Like if you have time, you can work with your users to propose, discuss solutions. You can do it like a yes and activity, so people will actually come up with solutions, but they don't have to. You can generate a lot of these. It's like a design thinking, like exercise, anything goes. And here's an actual example that our team did, not me personally, but our team did. Um, you can see there's a speedboat and there's some stickies on it. Um, and then these sticky notes are the unmet needs. and. In this framework, it's called, they are called opportunities. So you see on the top, you have your user outcomes, so some desired future state that you want to achieve. Here are your anchors that are keeping them, and then they can also brainstorm the solutions. 
And that's actually cool when they uh, think of solutions themselves and when you, when you all work together, you can generate a lot of good ideas. Um, another thing, like, okay, so not the actual representation of Red Hat customers, um, but another thing that you can do very quickly, um, you can do user interviews. So uh, some of you might have done interviews, so you have uh, attended some of them. They can be like an hour long. Usually people, not usually, sometimes some people get scared of an hour long interview. So if you want something done quickly, you can do like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, and you can chat to your customers. Um, so one tip that I want to give you, and that's this picture, uh, don't ask them if they like your uh, solution. So don't start there. Don't say, well, I had this great idea. What do you think? Because they will say, oh, I love it. I love it. And you would ask, well, do you use it? And I say, yeah, sure, sure. Because people are going to be nice, and they'll say they'll use anything. So just don't, <laughs> don't, don't just even ask them. Rather, if you have your outcome in mind, so something you want to achieve, ask them to tell you war stories. Tell them to tell you about the last time they did that thing and uh, listen to them. And people love talking about themselves, so they will go on for, for, for forever and ask them, and then what happened? And just be very interested. Um, yeah, so don't ask them what, if they would use your product, rather ask them to tell you a story. Or you can ask them, if I gave you a magic wand and you could solve your problem in one second, like, what would that be? Um, so, like I said, can be very short. Uh, if you can, offer incentives, because people like you know, getting freebies. Uh, so there's some of the tips for the interviews. And lastly, going on to the last one, to the last bullet, in pursuit of a desired outcome. And here, I just want to stress this, like all this terminology, like outcome, what the hell is an outcome? Don't worry about it too much. Just think of it as a goal. And here I put a quote by uh, Richard Feynman. Just give you a second to read it. All right, so, so, so just like, like I said, don't, don't worry about it too much. Like, don't, don't worry like what it is or like the exact definition of an outcome. There's none. There's like a whole lot of them. So an outcome, think of it as this paradise that you want to reach, this uh, perfect state, this goal. Uh, hopefully it will be connected to the business outcome, some your, uh, something from your company, so some business metric that you want to achieve. And from there, there will be a product outcome. The user outcome is something, some added value for your user. Here are some examples, so you just know what I'm talking about. Um, some example of the outcomes, for example, I want to set up a deployment environment. Here you can start talking like, well, how would, how would we do that? Like, what's keeping you from doing that? Or I want to avoid deploying apps with security vulnerabilities. Sure. Or I want to find a root cause for an app issue. So here you can discuss um, and put the user needs at sort of the heart of your development, right? Uh, so these outcomes, they actually have a very long shelf life, so you can keep using them and reusing them. These, I think, are two years old-ish or so. So these were around developer experience, something that our team worked on. Nowadays, there's a knock. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of questions when ask users about artificial intelligence. Obviously, I could not go the whole talk and not say AI once. Okay, so just to reiterate, you start with your outcomes. Outcomes. You go on to your opportunities, right? And the opportunities will be customer needs, desires, pain points, so things you want to solve. And then the only then you can go on to solutions. Right. Um, one more thing to stress is the difference between output and outcome. So historically, we were very focused on the output. So something that you create, some, something practically that you put out, like a feature, right? Um, which is good, it's a result of your activity, but you wanna make sure that your output is based on an outcome. So some actual added value that you put in that output, right? So just not doing things for the sake of doing them, but having a reason. So if you understand the user outcome, you will have a meaningful, successful output that will bring value to your user, to your product, and to your business in the end. Um, one more thing to mention around this whole framework is uh, the opportunity solution tree. Um, so it's, think of it as a way to organize your data. Uh, it's a visu visual and structural way. It's a little maybe hard to understand when you just look at it, 
But like once you start doing it, it actually makes sense. So on the top, you have your outcome that you've um, agreed upon. Then you can discover these opportunities, which are pain points. And then you have your solutions. And then you can experiment those solutions. OK, you say, that's nice and cool. Now I know what continuous discovery is. Now I know how to do it. How do I introduce it into my process? Like, um, all right, show of hands, who here works in agile sort of way in any shape or form? More or less? OK, that's a lot of you. OK. OK, but you are familiar with the concept of agile. If somebody's not familiar, please. All right, cool. OK, so it's an iterative and incremental approach to project management, right? So you work in this loop, so you work in sprints. There's a lot of flavors. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, because many teams do it differently. Um, in my team, let's say we do sprints. We do two-week sprints at, 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 the, at the time. And that's a very flexible way to work. And so you can work in this continuously. Like I said, I'm going to say word continuous a lot with this continuous improvement mindset. And this is a direct example of how you can put your discovery work into your Agile process. OK, so let's uh, unpack this for, for a second. So we have our discovery over there. Then we have the prioritization. Then we have the delivery over there. So let's say your engineers or our engineers want to start working on this feature in Sprint N. That's all the way on the right side. So they want to do that then. When does the discovery work have to start? It will start in the Sprint N minus 3. And N and minus 3, just to make it clear, it will be some six weeks before the actual implementation will start. So it's like way before, right? So that's when you do your discovery work, you talk to your customers, um, you re research your pain points and, and solutions and everything. And so then in Sprint N minus 2, you can start actually designing things. So you can do napkin sketches. You can go back to your customers if you're working continuously. Check with them if that's OK. Then you can maybe go on to design mockups. And then in Sprint N minus 1, you would actually talk to your engineers and say, these are the designs that we want to implement. And then they will put it into their, their next sprint. And then they will start working on it. At all at the same time, you can also do discovery for a different effort. They don't have to, like, you don't have to wait to finish one to, to go into another. You can do a few at the same time. Um, and these are the screenshots of um, Jira. I know people here are familiar with Jira. It's just a tool that we use. It's a, like a, a product tracking software where we create our tickets. And so here's like the concrete example of the feature I personally worked on. Um, so you can see there it's highlighted the discovery work that we did. And uh, that's the first feature that we started with for this body of work. And then we worked with engineering and project management and um, so the whole project trio to d explore different approaches, all the while talking to our customers. Uh, so we did everything. We did the interviews. I think we did a workshop in person, like the, the speedboat thing. We did the voting. I think we did a survey. And then once that discovery was complete, then we started implementing what we knew was the right direction to go in. All right, so I promised you an example as in like how did discovery work implement and change the direction. Uh, so I'm here I'm going to talk a little bit about secure software supply chain. Um, I want to emphasize how the security is important and you probably know that and here are some numbers. You probably know that better than me. I'm not going to go on about security and application security for too long. I just want to show you this graph uh, from 2022 the number of malicious packages went way up, like it, I think it two and a half times bigger. And so here we wanted to work with this outcome that's on the top that says minimize the likelihood of deploying applications that contain security vulnerabilities. Um, so from here, uh, we started work on this product that's called RHTAP, Red Hat Trusted Application Pipeline. And so just in sim simple words, what that is and what that does or what that used to do. So take code from a developer's laptop, sort of put it through a secure pipeline, build it securely, and sort of release it out to the world. So just to put simply, build applications in a secure way. Um, and here I want to emphasize the build factor. That's like the, yeah, sorry, the third one. OK, so how did discovery work influence RHDAP? 
So we started with two assumptions when we started building it. So we started with the assumption that customers want to use the same continuous integration and continuous delivery solution that Red Hat uses for its products. So they want to use the same one. It will be a very safe pipeline. It will be the same way as Red Hat does it. And the second assumption was that app developers would pay for software as a service-based solution from Red Hat, and that means cloud-based, so that would be somewhere in the internet. Um, so we actually built this, and it's a very good product. It's a very seamless experience. It's nice, and it's working, and it exists, and we love it. But at the time, uh, the product manager for this product decided to sort of question these assumptions. Are they really true? Um, and here's where UXD stepped in. So we did a survey as in like, what are the things, um, what are the underserved needs that our users want or need? So we talked to app developers about that. And then at the same time, we started the discovery interviews. And here it says that we did 100. You don't need to do 100. That's maybe way too many. We did get a lot of data, and we did have some trouble sort of organizing it all because it's really a lot of data. So we asked, talked to them a lot about software security and how they do it and how they don't do it. And altogether, we got valuable, significant feedback and a lot of data. And so that, yeah. No, sorry, I skipped one. So that le led us to sort of rethink our assumptions. So that made us realize that customers actually don't want to use the same CICD solution that Red Hat uses, that they have already invested heavily in their own and they want to bring their own. Uh, we also found out that the app developers don't want to pay and also that they don't want to use the SaaS-based solution. They want something on-prem. A lot of them actually cannot. They use the internet uh, at their work, so they need something that they can use on-prem. Um, so then we decided, we understood that we need to change our roadmap a little bit. So that's when all the discussions happen. And that's where UXG got a lot of recognition in a way that um, you don't have to trust person's opinions on things. We actually had the real data coming from real customers and that made us pivot. Uh, so here are the new and revised, uh, not, they're not assumptions anymore, they're user needs. And they say that uh, people need to integrate with their existing CI/CD tools that they have invested a lot of money in and that they um, probably might need a self-managed uh, solution. And that, in that way, we've successfully pivoted that conversation. And the UXD as a team got a lot of recognition. Um, so we have successfully used that customer discovery to realize what not to build. And that was based on customer data. Okay, so here are some takeaways, some practical tips that you can take and use in your day-to-day. -day. Uh, so if you have a great idea, and you think, oh my God, I wanna build a startup on this idea, um, or maybe you're working on some product, um, do start with discovery. So before you do anything, before you build anything, it's always easier to talk to people beforehand, not after you've built it. So it's not easier, maybe it's cheaper. Right, so you can realize, oh, maybe people don't need it, or maybe we don't have a customer for this one. Oh, I didn't think about uh, the user or the actual persona who's gonna use it. Um, so please always start with discovery, so we have evidence and you don't have just assumptions, you know, the concrete user needs. Um, if you're using Jira, you can incorporate talking to customers in that, or just schedule like a um, meeting on your calendar that's gonna go regularly. Um, you can use a speedboat that I talked to you about um, to identify these pain points so you can talk to the customers and keep regular talking with them to check in. So don't just talk to them once and then, then not. And that's actually a good tip for our team as well because uh, we did all of the discovery and then we didn't do anything for a while so now we're picking it back up. Um, okay. So uh, three things that I want to remember as well. Outcomes are the added values. Outputs is the result, so something agreed, uh, some thing that you produce in the end, and the opportunities and need a pain point, some, something you users are struggling with. Um, all right. Here I also want to mention the Conflux product and the Conflux booth that's up top, and please come and talk to us about it. That's um, one of the things we're working on. And some of the key takeaways from the Continuous Discovery Habits book. So deliver outcomes, not outputs. 
um, think about product discovery, not just delivery. Remember to include the whole product trio, not just one person, maybe more of them, and maybe pick people from different roles. Um, build this opportunity solution tree, and then you can actually work with it and base the solution on that and do workshops and so, um, think of solutions and create things based on that. And just in general, practice this continuous discovery. Um, these are some of the resources. So generally, I would just um, recommend going to producttalk.org, and that's uh, the site that talks it has every single resource. They even have courses on continuous discovery, so you can do anything really there. And in the spirit of continuous discovery, we'd love to chat. So uh, if you want to talk to us about AI, um, that's the first QR code. If you're just generally interested in talking to us or just maybe answering some questions or um, being a part of this discovery process, you can join our research community. That's the uh, second QR code right there. And uh, if the right opportunity comes along, when and if the right opportunity comes along, we'll contact you. And thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have a couple minutes for questions. How many? Okay. Yes. Well, okay. The question is how you do continuous discovery in an existing product or in a legacy product, right? If you already have something. Well, it's the same way as you would do for a new product, really. If you want to find out something that you don't know, if you have a specific business metric that you want to achieve, or if you want to build something and you have an idea for a new feature or anything, you can always go to your customers and talk to them. Or you don't even have to have that. You can just go ahead and talk to them. I don't see why not. I mean, if you have customers, you can talk to them. If you don't have customers, you can find somebody who might be a potential customer or who might be in that sort of persona category generally and just talk to them. Or you can talk to even to your, or to your to somebody who's not working on the same product and just ask them questions. And usually they give you valuable feedback because they don't know the product as well as you do, and they will tell you things. Okay, so the question is, which tool works best when gathering feedback from customers? Um, well, here there can be a bunch of tools, like if you mean when talking to them or when analyzing data. Uh, I'm sorry, like gathering the data. Gathering the data? Okay, so gathering the data, if you're doing these interviews, then you would want to use some sort of online um, tool like Google Meet or Zoom or what have you. It can, You mean to analyze the interviews? Yeah. Oh, interviews. Oh, you mean you mean not tool, tool, but rather, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can. Okay, I understand. So it's not a tool, tool, like not a software thing, but like okay, yeah. So. You, a way to, yeah, yeah. So you can do interviews, you can do workshops if you can. Um, you can also send out surveys, you can just chat to them online. I mean, anything goes. Best thing, I guess, is to do the interview. If you want to find out something, you can ask them questions and then you can build a conversation so you can generally talk to a person. It's, it's always better than sending a survey their way and just hoping that they will send. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah? Maybe I will follow up on this uh, with uh, so uh, how about uh, uh, some tips or tools uh, for analyzing data? Yeah, I mean you said you said that you had uh, quite a lot, lot of data today, like yeah. hundred interviews, so it helps to pick up many data. Uh, how do you group them together effectively and make some tips for that? Yeah. Sure, sure. When we were started, well we did customer snapshots after the interview because it's like a visual way. To represent whatever you, data you gathered, so 
you would have like think of it like if, I don't know if you've seen a persona kind of uh, page that that's more or less similar to that. So you can put it in that. Um, in the long run, it was not as sustainable because we did too too many probably for this one because OPM had a lot of energy. Um, in the end, we also put them online like in a tool that stores all your interviews. It's like all the videos. It will store all the videos. And then it will produce the scripts for the interview, so it will uh, give you the text. And then you can also do the labels. So if you're interested in some particular problem, let's say, okay, let's take just software security, then you can search it and it will go through all of them and highlight every interview that say mention software security. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention names of such tools, but they, they exist. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>